So welcome back to Fort Benning, or by the time this comes out, Fort Moore, and our tour of the BAE MPF vehicle, the non-select. Now, my basis for comparison for this is the old CCVL from the 1980s, which basically became the M8, which basically became this particular vehicle. However, we're talking about difference in two generations, and I don't think this vehicle aged quite as well as perhaps some others would have. Uh, the CCVL was perfectly reasonable, very fightable, and I didn't see any great issue with it. Obviously, neither did the Army see a huge issue with the M8, as it was indeed selected for service. Now, that's not to say that because it was non-select that this is a bad vehicle. It actually has some pretty neat features. You've already seen, for example, the uh, engine compartment uh, for maintenance without removing the engine. Uh, there are some other good points of this vehicle as well. However, if I go into personal viewpoint mode after only spending you know, an hour wandering around the two different vehicles, my immediate impression is that the correct vehicle was selected. Now again, that's not to say this is a bad vehicle. It may well find a niche somewhere else, but uh, of the two, for the role in which uh, it is intended, I think uh, the GDLS probably was better. But anyway, that said, let's go around. Uh, the advantage to this is uh, I've had a little bit more time to look over this vehicle, so I, I've learned a few things as I've been crawling over it. Uh, as you look around the outside, so one of the first differences is this hatch here. Uh, on the CCVL, it was very easy to open up. You can look down into the autoloader. I have a feeling it's not supposed to be opened up quite as much. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole bunch of bolts. I, there's, there's bolts on all parts of this vehicle as well. It looks like you have quick release pins uh, holding this side panel down, but I don't think it was designed to be quickly released. Now the loading of the autoloader in this actually is from the hatch in the back. Uh, it's also where the offloading is if you decide you, you want to empty the autoloader without firing it. So really, outside for maintenance or repair purposes, there shouldn't really be any great need to open up this pair of hatches here. Which, by the way, if you go around this vehicle, if you're, if you're at the museum visiting, and you happen to have a magnet, you will be surprised as to how much of this vehicle is not magnetic, uh, or not ferrous, if you wish. Uh, so there's a lot of titanium and aluminium used in here, as well as steel, simply to keep the weight down. Uh, but that's beside the point. So other features on here, obviously we've got the antenna. Uh, down behind me, you're going to see the mounting point for the GBCP system, the old Blue Force track of the satellite and the dagger antenna. And you will also notice that the two crewmen both have their hatches. So unlike, let's say, an M1 where the gunner slides down and goes forward, he has his own forward opening hatch here. The TC has his hatch behind him. Now, the Caliber 50 is actually mounted on a proper T&D, and this cupola does theoretically spin. I can't figure out how to make it spin. I don't see a lock that I'm missing, uh, but I'm told maybe it's just unbalanced because you need the 50 cal on the front to balance it and spin it around. The hatch has a cotter pin just for safety to keep it in place, uh, but as I've actually put for this museum vehicle that put blocks on a lot of things and uh, it will come up there's only it looks like there's only the one additional position so it's full open or all down there's no umbrella position or overhead protected on the other hand there are certainly a good variety of what is it one two three four five six seven seven uh, optics to look out on so he's not entirely blind although of course you will notice that there is no itv here uh, the, or the CITV, as there is on the General Dynamics prototype. Apparently it wasn't an absolute requirement in the tender. Or maybe it wasn't, that's why this vehicle was non-select. Uh, it ended up, it failed to meet some requirement. I can't remember what it is. In fact, I'm not sure they even said. Uh, but uh, anyway, so there's no CITV, so that's another disadvantage when it comes down to vision and optics. But it does have the four cameras all around the situational awareness. Because again, this vehicle was going to be uh, operating in close support of infantry, so they wanted to make sure you weren't about to run over somebody. Uh, EW system on the back right corner there, it's empty now, of course, uh, for the uh, various different jammers. 
crosswind sensor on the back there as well and stowage it's not exactly an m1 in terms of stowage and compartments really is it there is yeah there's almost nothing there's a small little thing on the left of the, now granted you've only got three people to carry the stowage of as opposed to four but uh, you, you would hope for a little bit more so that's about it finally uh, one what am i doing on uh, sitting on uh, i am sitting on the seat back so the seat all the way up i'm sitting down on the back now there is a, a fold down seat back uh, so you can stand on it i would hope you would lower the platform if you did that because it, it is very high if i stand on the seat back i go off the top of the screen uh, but i haven't really had much time to play with that so that's it for the intro to the inside now as the video continues you're going to see i'm going to be splicing a little bit between the visit up in detroit in warren and this visit here depending on whether or not there's anything interesting particularly being said by colonel george uh, as opposed to something on this vehicle so just a little bit of a heads up the video is going to be a little bit schizophrenic but i think you'll uh, you'll accept that given what comes out of it this is cheating You want to go on ahead and crawl on in? Um, I'm looking at the best way of doing this. And... Feet first. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, how you should jump into life. Feet first. Okay. Oh. I mean, you saw I got into a chenillette last <laughs> week, which is like one tenth the size of this thing. Okay. I guess once you do it a few times, you figure out how to get in a bit easier. Right, I am now inside a British Aerospace MPF contender. Uh, basically, the old M8 upgraded. Do you know, did they keep the same hull, or did they build an entirely new hull for this as well? So, my, I believe they built an entirely new hull. Okay, so as you may have noticed, getting in is a pain uh, i've done this now a couple of times and i still haven't figured out a good way of doing this uh, in fact it's probably simpler just to spin the turret and slide down through the gunner's position there is a bright yellow quick release here which if it goes all the way up you'll drop the uh, drop the seat all the way back so you can extract if necessary uh, the driver if he's wounded or just if you want to get in he couldn't be arsed to contort yourself through this thing So I'll just lock that back into place. I note that it has a three-position harness. So one over each shoulder comes down and meets the uh, receptacle between the legs and As I was rooting around trying to see if there was a an adjustment control to move the slight seat forwards and back and I haven't found it uh, they have a mounting point in here for, of all things, a seatbelt cutter. So there's actually a stowage point for a seatbelt cutter in here. So let me see. It took me forever to get it back in last time, but I think I know what I'm doing this time. There we go. Uh, I only see one pedal, so I'm going to guess. Yep, it's the, uh, the twist throttle for the accelerator and a big, very big brake. Uh, it's very simple controls. Ah, I see the, the familiar headlight controls, not the World War II ones, the, the, the more post 21st century Humvee. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. This actually, this isn't bad, comfort wise. Oh, you got the same transmission selector. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the GDLS MPF also had an Allison, if I recall. Both vehicles use uh, that the Allison uh, 3040MX. Was that a requirement, or just they both decided that was the, the transmission out there? That was the, the way both LEM decided to go independently. I bet the guys at Allison were happy. No matter who wins, they win. <laughs> <laughs> so driving, really easy. Anybody used to do an M1. So it's uh, a tiller system, key bar, with twist to accelerate, and just you know the one big brake in the bottom there. Big enough that you can put both feet down if you really have to. Uh, engine controls on the right, so start, stop, well, master power first, and then engine on and off. Has a tack idle option. Uh, if you want tack idle, tack idle is a higher level of idle. Uh, the transmission by Allison, really simple. It's a push button. Drive, 
neutral and reverse. You push the appropriate one. Now there there are ranges, so you can you got a, a mode select and you can manually change the ranges. It seems, uh, but uh, that's all you have to do to drive it. On the left hand side, you you have your various auxiliary controls. So fire extinguishers for the crew compartment, the engine compartment, and the fuel system. Auxiliary controls are ventilation, NBC or C burn they call it now, and a heater, um, a fan, bilge pump, and temp. I'm not sure what the temperature is. Uh, and mo mobility signals and lighting controls, i.e. the indicators, left right and horn in the middle. So it's got a horn. And the actual lighting control panel at the bottom, you've seen that in a lot of modern vehicles, that's kind of standard issue. Intercom system for uh, the driver is, it's the same one that's been in since the year dot almost. Uh, here's a light on the left. Winterization heater, oh, flashlight marker down there. I mean, the, the controls on this are, they look incredibly simple. Well, looks like the seat is supposed to raise and lower. It does. Can't seem to figure out why or how, but come on, the other bugger. Yeah, Check whatever. Not important. You have to take the weight off to move the seat up and down. We go. We'll go then. Yeah, saw it. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I can hit the pedals. All will be well. Uh, so I don't see. Okay, so if I'm driving around then, head down, and I want to use either the external cameras or the night vision, I use this monitor on the right. So you don't. There's an additional device that uh, that plugs in to the top of the vehicle. It mounts in to the top of the vehicle. Oh, the mounts are actually here. We don't we don't have that device currently installed. Okay. Uh, but that device mounts in and gives you access to uh, to the camera would it be permanently stowed there or do i have to you know it's getting dark i need to put it up it's uh it is put there um, as needed so it is not permanently there oh the speedometer will be on the uh, on the digital as well exactly. then, i guess uh, let's see what do we have back here. Mythic fire extinguisher system, manual discharge, yeah, fuel comp crew. Well, that's fire suppression. This is a warning system. It looks like there's sensors all over. I'm gonna guess this is a halon vent. Uh, let's see what's on the left hand side. Manual fire extinguisher, a fan, a fire sensors. So he's got five vision ports to steer and to look out of, which uh, is definitely an improvement. Uh, there's two positions for the hatch. So this is the full open. There's one just a little bit further down. Uh, locks in place, obviously, with this. So you'd, you probably would release using it. Yeah, that would be your, your release to open up the hatch. But unfortunately, if this is as far as it goes, because the gun is up top, you kind of wish they had gone with the Sheridan type of revolving hatch. It, this, I, I'm not a fan. Anyway, uh, so other than that, I mean, modern vehicles, modern military vehicles are actually very easy to drive. And from talking to some people who have actually driven this, it's actually a, a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a very easy, very nice vehicle to drive. Uh, once you can get into the driver's position. However, I hate to say it, but this is the good part. Things get a little bit more annoying when you get into the turret. So the driver has one additional task, and that is replenishment of the coaxial ammunition. The coax ammo is stored on the outside of the turret basket, on the opposite side of the turret to the crew. So it's crew, autoloader and cannon, externally stowed coaxial ammunition. So what uh, has to happen is you spin the turret off to the right hand side. This means that the ammunition cans, the 200 round cans, are now accessible to the driver. He'll grab a couple, put them on the floor behind them, they'll spin the turret back, 
and then he can pass the cans back to the uh, crew compartment uh, through the, where the gunner's feet are. Uh, you got to admit, it is at least an efficient use of space. Did anybody say which one is more fun to drive? Um, yeah, so I have not driven one of these. It has not, not been as much of our focus. I have not driven one of these. Um, you know, it's a different weight class, I suspect. It's yeah, this is a lot lighter. So the other one was up to 80,000 pounds. So, so this is 26 tons. Yeah. So we, uh, 26 tons is the combat weight. It's a, it's a very different approach uh, to the vehicle. Yeah, so, so they were handy enough to put a data plate right here. It says <laughs> uh, combat weight 80,000 pounds. Uh, it's got all the, all the dimensions that you need. Okay, just looking behind, I see a big red button. I'm sure that's important and I should not push it. Any idea what BA you're going to do with this now? I mean, it, does this belong to the Army? Uh, so this this belongs to the Army. This is a piece of Army equipment right now. So it's going to go to Fort Benning next? So we're, we are uh, currently looking at what options we can do to utilize them. What What is our best approach to making sure that we still bring value to the taxpayer? Um, and, and that could equal a couple things. Um, that GD, uh, sorry, uh, BAE is still uh, certainly has the opportunity to uh, to sell this vehicle e either for future RV use or, or to you know uh, some of our foreign prior partners also. I'm, I'm sure Rob Cogan or Len Dyer would love to have this in their collection down down at the museum there in in Benny. Come on, you can you can donate one to the museum. Oh, we would love to if they're interested. Uh, vehicle serial number, MPF PV11. So they built at least 11 of these. They built at least 11. Production date 2021-0930. So you were talking about how quick this program went. So this was produced a year and a half ago. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, roughly. Actually, less than that. September 2021. This was produced a year ago. That's fast. It, it's fast. Right, it was very fast, and went, once uh, once we were produced, and I'll tell you, this was at the end of our prototype production runs. This was one of the last vehicles made, uh, but once they were produced, we pushed them into testing, uh, as well as the, the ones that preceded it, pushed into testing as as quickly as we could. The, the The goal really was to get this capability out to the force. So, um, so as soon as vehicles started uh, coming off the line, we started testing them, characterizing them, getting to soldiers. Uh, doing touch points and, and figuring out where uh, where each of the vehicles stood. Oh bugger, the tank is on fire. Yeah. Oh jeez. <laughs> it's almost like I need to drop the seat back and get my legs out first. Can that be done? Yeah, there, looks like there's a lever here. That drops the seat back. I can pull my legs up and out. We're not judging. Check, just check the hatch is locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I put any weight on it. Uh, there we go. That's one way of getting out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the gunner seat is one I would not want to spend a heck of a lot of time in. Uh, I mean, I can sit relatively comfortable as long as I'm facing forwards, but I can't help but notice that my knees are kind of overhanging outside the turret basket, which uh, doesn't seem reassuring for a traverse, so I'd, I'd have to kind of squeeze my knee over as I'm spinning around. The, the gunner's controls are, again, very similar to a tank or a Bradley, so elevate the press, laser rangefinder, trigger, turn. Manual traverse on the right here, and there's an elevation on the left, which does bring up a problem because in order to traverse it, I need to, to move my knees to the right, which then means that the knees are going to be overhanging the turret basket as I'm traversing. Flaw. All right, so I see, uh, obviously, the, the big hatch comes down. It's, it's quite thick. I mean, look at the thickness of it. It's, it's not a small hatch. Um, controls for the uh, doghouse doors, the, the shutters, the armored visors. Coaxial machine gun mount is on the right hand side and uh, as you can see it's mounted a little bit high. The links and brass come down the chute and simply get ejected out a little hole on the right hand side which hopefully uh, they'd put some canvas around it or something to, uh, to help if it was uh, NBC environment because it's rather a large hole. 
uh, for the NBC system. The same intercom system on the right for him. Uh, he's got a fan down the lower right. The sighting system to his front. Well, okay. Relaxed viewing monitor. So you got day and night, you got polarity, uh, bore sights. Um, magnification is three on the left, 13 on the right. So those are the two magnifications that you're most likely to use. So that's why it goes three, six, 50, 25, 13. So that if you have to go from high mag to low mag, you simply rotate it all the way and you're not, you don't have to take your head away from the site to, uh, to see which setting you've come down to. Uh, the 50 is, uh, if I recall, more an electronic zoom, not an optical zoom. Uh, I see the first and last return toggle here for the laser rangefinder. Thermal controls on the right, it looks like. Uh, TRU ready. And, I mean, these are the main controls, but uh, you have them, uh, some additional ones on the right. As I squeeze around, you can see the auxiliary sight here. It's very interesting. So ordinarily, when you think about an auxiliary sight, you think one of several techniques. One, like the M1, is a direct vision telescope. It's just coaxial to the main gun and goes out. There is the auxiliary periscope, such as you saw in Challenger, goes out the roof. Or there are backup cameras. It's basically like on a CV90. It's just a t small little camera mounted on the roof that has its own dedicated battery-operated circuit uh, to come down to a monitor down here. The advantage of that uh, is that there's no big hole in the armor at all. This, though, is none of the above. It looks like a very large fiber optic cable is used to transmit from the lens at one end to the lens at this end. Uh, because I mean, I'll look in and it is your typical gas sight uh, with a choke sight up top and uh, range scales on for Sabo, HEP, and heat. And if you look through it, it gives no indication of being anything other than a traditional auxiliary sight. But in order to make everything fit, They've used this fiber optic cable. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. Now, frankly, it's brilliant, <laughs> I have to say. Really, it's a very good idea. Um, obviously, there's only so many kinks you can put into it, but uh, yeah, fantastic. So, gunner's controls on the left-hand side. So, selectors for main gun and coaxial. The main gun ammo selector type is Sabo on the left and heat all the way to the right. So those are obviously the two that they consider to be the most important to shoot quickly. Canister is an option. HEP is an option. High splits of plastic, that's the HESH to British folks. And an unload option. So if you have to unload the uh, autoloader. Now the thing about HEP and canister, of course, is this is in effect an assault gun. They won't call it an assault gun, but that's what this is for. And HEP and canister are very useful in the assault gun role, uh, which actually does beg the question why well, you need Sabre and Heat is the two defaults. My suspect is because those are the two that you need fastest without having to look. If you're shooting up uh, fortification, you probably have enough time to take your head away from the site and see which setting you've selected. Turret power, uh, so hydraulic power for the vehicle and the loader system. Turret traverse power, turret elevation power, I'll say a lot of them. Uh, general electrical power and shutdowns for the uh, tank as a whole and the turret. So that just leaves us then with the autoloader itself. So to access that, you have to move this display screen out of the way or in the way of the camera. And, and let's see, rotate. Oh, Jesus, okay. <laughs> Note to self, is it hinged? It is, it is hinged. It's a heavy bugger though, isn't it? And now I can see the autoloader. So as I'm looking at it, it looks like pretty much exactly the same autoloader as was in the CCVL from the 1980s. Um, there may be some differences, but what you have are 21 rounds vertically stowed on basically a conveyor belt. The round that you need goes to the back, gets picked up by the loading system, and round. If there's a misfire, 
it replaces the round back into the ammunition carousel and moves around uh, to the next round. In addition to the 21 rounds that are on the loader, uh, there's an additional seven stored in the front left hull next to the driver. Uh, of course, one of the advantages of this auto loader system is that you have uh, an inch of armor basically between you and any booms, which of course should be vented out in that direction. Uh, so I don't actually know very much more about the autoloader. Uh, it feeds the XM35 cannon that we talked about earlier. And yeah, I'll, uh, I'll close up now. So hopefully there's never really any need for you to actually access this except in the case of extreme problem and you have to manually start loading the cannon. Because ordinarily loading the auto loader is done as I say from the back. Uh, but uh, yeah, that is the gunner's position. Can't say I like it. It's worse than the driver's position, which wasn't fantastic, but it gets worse. Yeah, this is where it really gets bad, and please forgive the backlight, there's not much I can do about it. Okay, so my left foot is on a footrest. My right foot, actually, it is a bit of a footrest. But uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's theoretically more comfortable for my legs than the uh, gunner's position, but that's where the problems uh, basically begin. So as I'm sitting here uh, with the main commander's viewing monitor on the right hand side, you'll see that if I put my arm where the gun uh, commander's override is, my shoulder is actually behind this monitor. Uh, to access the various controls it's over on the right shoulder, I'll, I'll talk in a second, but uh, this is basically the same monitor as was uh, down by the driver's position, so we can see uh, the gunner's sight can be repeated here. The 360 degree situational awareness can be repeated here. Uh, good system, a little bit in your face. Uh, unfortunately, the problems even get worse. So there are two monitors in this vehicle. One, as I said, is on the right hand side. The other, that is the uh, was it it's called the modular vehicle control computer or something like that? It has a real name. I'll, I'll, I'll put it onto the subtitles. This swings around and you have another monitor right here in front of your face. And you're kind of stuck. Uh, I mean, I guess, it, if, let's see if this goes down at all. It, it didn't go down very far. So this is how you'd be f fighting your tank. Yeah. Let's get this back out of the way here, lock that away. Coaxial bin on the right hand side is a thousand rounds in the ready rack. Fantastic, but as I say again, to get to get more than that thousand rounds, you gotta do some cross-loading from the opposite side of the turret. Radios are located behind me uh, in this compartment. The commander's control box for the systems is very similar to that of the gunner. He's got one or two additional features. First, he's got smoke grenade launchers. There is a hatch override, so the power traverse is not going to operate if the driver's hatch is open. Can't imagine why they might want to do that, but it's the same on the M1. But if you really do have to traverse the turret under power with the guy with the hatch open, be the guy in it or not, you gotta hold up this hatch override switch. Gun fan lamp test battle range, that's your battle site. So if you don't if your laser range finder is down and you just push that button and a default is input into the computer, probably about a thousand meters for 105 Sabo. I could be wrong. But if you don't like that, there's an add or drop to increase or lower the amount of uh, range uh, being put into the ballistic computer. You have the same main gun and coax 
and in the back you have the same Sabo unload HEP canister heat and one spare. Now there's one additional button on here as well. It, uh, of course there's a command to override is also one of them. Uh, but in addition to the loader execute button to actually operate the loader. Now it doesn't say load because execute could be load the round, unload the round, stow the round, uh, offload the round from the vehicle entirely. The, this control by combination of the computer system and the, uh, and the control panel. There's also a reload mode here from auto or off. If it's an off, then every time you want to load around, you got to think about what you want to load, set your setter, and then hit the load button, or the execute button. However, if you have it in auto, then as long as the gunner is pulling the trigger, the auto loader will immediately start loading the same type of round until it runs out. Right, uh, left hand side. Fire extinguisher, uh, J box, Halon again, controls for the hatch, and now here's another new feature. As I'm looking over my right shoulder at the J box, I see a loudspeaker, and it looks like the same ancient loudspeaker. It's probably been around since before Vietnam, for all I know. Uh, which means that if you're out of the vehicle stretching your legs, as you probably are required to do every now and then. I mean, God, I wouldn't like to think about doing NBC conditions in here. Uh, you can uh, hear anybody calling for you on the radio without having to worry about keeping a manned radio watch, somebody with a helmet on. So, nice touch there. Actually, there's a fair bit of, I'm not going to call it wasted space. I'm sure they can find something to do with it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's nothing much in there right now. Yeah. So, no CRTV. Reasonable periscopes, awful position. Gunner's not much better. Now again, the competitor to this is basically an M1 turret. Uh, teens a bit smaller, but as near as makes no difference. I can see which one I would rather fight in. Now, again, the CCVL wasn't a bad vehicle, but the CCVL was a 1980s vehicle. The M8, which was accepted before it was canceled in the Cold War, post-Cold War cutbacks, that was a 1990s vehicle. This is now a vehicle for the 2020s, and as you can see, there's a lot more stuff inside it that you're trying to fit into the same form factor of the turret. And I'm not sure it worked. Now, if you're some export nations that aren't Iowa-fed farm boys or whatever, um, uh, I, I can see this actually having some uh, suitability. I mean, for example, uh, it was a Thailand has this Stingray light tank. I could see an argument for this. For the MPF role, especially when you're talking about a 40-ton vehicle versus this is 28 tons, I think I'd rather have the, uh, the GDLS as the infantry support vehicle, and that's probably one of the reasons, other than whatever the contractual one was, that this didn't make it. I mean, not, not as if it's not a fightable vehicle, but not for me. Anyway, lots of caveats. And because there are only those two positions inside the turret, I am now going to cut back out and do the close out with Colonel George. Right, well, most of you probably know me better from my work with World War II research or early Cold War, because that's the sort of archives that I have access to in the museum. So it is a rare treat for me to come up and look at some of the modern stuff, which actually interests me a little bit more, not just because of personal interest, but also professional interest, because in my other job, I am an armor officer. Uh, but it has been a lot of fun, a bit eye-opening. Thank you very much, and of course to the rest of the staff up here at PEO GCS for these uh, tours of some of the new vehicles that will be coming to an army base near you. Uh, any last thoughts on the MPF? Uh, no, uh, not too many last thoughts. Thank you so much for coming out and, and getting a chance to, uh, to talk to us and, and to see where the Army is going. We, uh, we love bringing you around the vehicles. Uh, we, we think this is an important capability that we're going to get to soldiers, uh, and, and we're excited to, to push forward on it. All right, so I, I've got to find an excuse to come back. The problem is it's Michigan, and it's already October. <laughs> So it'll be a few months yet. Maybe I'll have a new toy that, that we can check out. We're, we're always developing something new. <laughs> All right, well, again, thank you very much to POGCS and the staff here. Thank you to the patrons for funding me the trip to get up here. 
Hope you all found it interesting and informative. And I will talk to you on the next one. Take care. That's why you wear helmets in a tank. I don't often bash my head. I've started developing something of a sixth sense, but yeah, that one got me.